Franz von Kearney, Writings by Frank Schmidt, on the Danube Swabian people. These collected writings are republished in memory of the author, Frank Schmidt, so that others may continue to enjoy his work. May his spirit live on. Ethnic Cleansing of Danube Swabians After Hitler's invasion of Russia, the communists, now on the side of the Soviet Union, entered the war they had rejected just a couple of months before. No less than six major resistance groups in the unoccupied mountains of Bosnia made sorties against German supply lines to Greece, but mostly fought each other. The partisans, due to Churchill's support, soon gained the upper hand. They attacked isolated bases, and when the outnumbered Germans surrendered, they were killed on the spot. To satisfy the bloodlust of Tito's primitive fighters, their bodies were mutilated in a manner which is utterly revolting to civilized people. The Germans retaliated by burning the villages that harbored partisans and shooting 10 hostages for every German that was killed. Violence begets violence. And this practice has only intensified the struggle. There were so many forces fighting in the mountains, the Germans didn't know who was who. It was a battle fought with the utmost cruelty by all sides. The struggle took place far from Danube Swabian settlements, and they were not involved in the conflict. In the fall of 1944, Tito's anti-fascist council gathered at JG in Bosnia and passed a resolution which consisted of three main points. When the Yugoslav state was re-established, those of German, nationality, 650,000 people, the largest non-Slavic ethnic group in pre-war Yugoslavia, were to be dispossessed and deprived of all human rights, including the right to life. Their property was to be distributed among Tito's rough, unlettered fighters who were his main support. This was to be achieved through 1. Mass liquidation 2. Mass deportation 3. Extermination through starvation and forced labor in concentration camps. Partisans would acquire the best homes in the country, as well as farms and livestock of the dispossessed. Tito, the great benefactor, was indeed a good man who gave his minions and peasant fighters something worth fighting for. They didn't have to work for it. All they had to do was to kill, kill, kill. As the Red Army drove through the neat Danube, Swabian villages and towns in what was then the Hungarian Bachka, Baranya, Serbian Banat, Croatian Sermia and Slavonia, partisan Sermia and Slavonia, partisan bands followed in its wake and took possession of their promised land. But first, they had to liquidate the Swabians. The methods varied from place to place, but the result was the same. Death via unspeakable torture. It happened so often that it was the rule rather than the exception. Their first victims were usually the mayor, the town council, priests, teachers, merchants, or anyone some partisan took exception to. The victims' hands were tied with wire, and they were taken into a building where they were slaughtered by bloodthirsty partisans who had long ago lost their humanity. As the victims lay helpless in the center, Thoroughly inebriated butchers danced the cola in a circle and sang partisan songs. From time to time, they would break off and in a frenzy of bloodletting, took turns stabbing their prisoners to death while relishing their screams and moans. Hefty partisankas, female partisans, took particular delight in cutting off the genitals of the victims while they still showed signs of life. The killing usually ended in the wee hours of the morning when the prisoners had been beaten to an unrecognizable pulp and their tormentors slumped onto the blood-soaked floor in a drunken stupor. When all the men in the community had been rounded up, and those who appeared to be better off than the others, the hated capitalists had been selected. They were marched out of town where they first had to dig their graves, and were then shot and buried. Others were deported to slave labor camps in Yugoslavia and Russia, where they were worked to death. The young women between the ages of 16 and 40 were rounded up and sent to Russia in cattle cars where they slaved away during hard labor at ancient coal mines and building sites. When they were released five years later, one in four were never to see her home or family again. The broken and ailing women could not return to their homes, but were transported to Germany. Some found family members and resumed normal lives. Practically all of these women bear physical scars from which they will suffer for the rest of their lives. The rest, the handicapped women with young children and the aged were forced out of their homes by, of course, well-armed partisans. One can imagine the tears and wailing of utterly defenseless women with small children whose husbands were away, who were probably also caring for parents or grandparents when they were given but a few minutes to leave their home forever. House, furniture, photo albums, garden, pets, domestic animals, and a thousand memories had to be left behind. They marched along dusty roads in columns of four, accompanied by an armed escort. It must have been a sad sight. Women carrying small bundles of a few necessities, all the possessions the partisans allowed them to take, and their small children clutching their mother's skirts, crying uncontrollably, while guards threatened them with guns and yelled at them to get moving. Old men who could not keep up were shot on the spot in front of families and grandchildren. Their bodies were thrown into a ditch. Old women fared no better. If they could not keep a steady pace, they were severely beaten by the guards. A dozen Danube Swabian towns like Gakwa and Rudolf Snod had been designated as concentration camps by Tito's most despicable henchman and closest advisor Moise Pajade. He is said to be primarily responsible for the planned extermination of the Danube Swabians. The available houses in these towns had all been stripped of furniture 
and the internees, as they were officially called, had to sleep on a straw-covered floor, 30 to a room. Others slept in barns or stables. There was no fuel to provide heat, and no cleaning materials were available. Since the intention was to starve them to death, the only food they obtained in the camp was swill. Many were able to sustain their lives by stealing out of camp at night at the risk of their lives and begging for food from the local Serbs or Hungarians, former neighbors who were mostly sympathetic and compassionate people. Had that not been so, no one would have survived in the camps. Because there were so few survivors, the Tito regime closed the camps in the spring of 1948. Those who perished from maltreatment, starvation, and disease are buried in nearby mass graves, where no markers may be put to remind passers-by of the atrocities committed there. The emaciated few who remained alive escaped into nearby Hungary and made their way to the west. As soon as the partisans had taken over a town, they selected young Danube Swabian women, preferably blondes, who were torn from their families and taken to a compound in Pansivo, across the river from Belgrade. There, they were kept like caged animals to satisfy the sexual lusts of Tito's elite troops and foul-smelling partisan brutes. The girls who were from decent homes were physically and sexually abused by the most loathsome of creatures. If they resisted, they were shot. Theirs was a hopeless life, and there was no one to help them out of their misery. Their lives were mercifully short. When the inevitable happened, they all became infected with syphilis. To prevent it from spreading, the local army commander ordered the remaining 150 women to be taken to a remote pasture, where they first had to strip and were then summarily shot to death. The reason they had to take their clothes off was that the partisans intended to sell them on the black market. In Yugoslavia at the time, used clothing was at a premium, but would not be saleable if riddled with bullet holes. About 40,000 orphan Danube. Swabian children were left behind in the camps after their mothers. Grandparents and good neighbors had died of starvation, or typhoid, and there was no one left to care for them. They were taken to communist children's homes in other parts of Yugoslavia, and were given Slavic names. Consequently, they soon lost their language and German identity. As the Turks had done in past centuries with their enemies' children, they were raised as Janissaries, fighters for Tidu. However, some 5,000 of the older children, ages 8 to 12, who would remember their German ancestry were sent to deportation centers such as Derventa Doboja Usora. Each of the 5,000 was put to death at a local sugar refinery. Ivan Baris, a Croatian prisoner who now lives in Germany, was an eyewitness to the atrocity. He, along with other prisoners, had to take the children from railway cars to the killing site and had a chance to speak to the confused and crying children. He memorized some of their names and places they came from. All were from Danube Swabian communities in Bachka, Banat, Sermaya, Baranya, and Slavonia. After the war, 5,000 orphan children were located, and with the aid of the German Red Cross, they were eventually reunited with relatives in the West. What happened to the other 30,000? No one seems to know. If they survived, two things are certain. They were raised as Janissaries and knew nothing of their German background. From those who were released to the West, we know that they were led to believe that it was the Germans who had killed their parents. It's a cruel world. We're really grateful for your time spent tuning into this captivating episode that dives into the history of the Donau Schwaben on the Franz von Kearney YouTube channel. Our content takes inspiration from the insightful writings of Frank Schmidt, unraveling the fascinating story of the Danube Swabians. If this episode caught your interest, we warmly invite you to support us by liking, subscribing, and sharing it with your Donau Schwaben relatives, friends, and social clubs. Anyone intrigued by the enthralling history of the Danube Swabians, these small gestures truly make a big impact for a new channel like ours. For those seeking more information about the Donau Schwaben or this episode, feel free to explore the show notes below for links and related resources. Once again, we extend our heartfelt thanks for tuning in. Wir sind Donau Schwaben, Kinders, Kinder.